You're listening to an Airwave Media Podcast. Get cash for clothes at Plato's Closet in North Charleston and West Ashley. It's so easy. Recycle, earn cash, repeat. We pay cash on the spot for your trendy, gently used clothing, shoes, and accessories. At Plato's Closet, we buy all seasons, all day, every day. It's time to clean out your closet and cash in. Bring in your denim, graphic tees, athletic wear, shoes, handbags, and more. Sell your styles to Plato's Closet for cash. Then do it again. Plato's Closet, located in West Ashley on Sam Rittenberg Boulevard and North Charleston on Rivers Avenue. Hello everyone and welcome to History of the Second World War, episode 166, The Invasion of Norway Part 4, The Gallant Glowworm. This week a big thank you goes out to Martin for choosing to support the podcast by becoming a member. You can find out more about supporting the podcast over at historyofthesecondworldwar.com slash members. In the weeks and months before the German invasion of Norway in April 1940, there was at least some evidence that such an action was being planned by both sides. On the German side, they had learned as early as January that certain units were being pulled out of the line in France to prepare for a British and French invasion of Northern Europe, including French Alpine troops. This was added to the evidence that was also known, like the increase in British naval activity near the coast of Norway and some intercepted communications in late March, which seemed to make it clear to German leaders that British and French leaders were planning something. On the side of the Allies, there was also growing evidence in March 1940 that the Germans were going to do something. It was unclear exactly what that something was going to be, though. Before diving into what the evidence was, first it's important to talk about the concept of cognitive priming. Priming is a psychological concept in which you can prime the brain to provide certain responses based on giving it prior input. So, for example, if I were to say the word table and then ask you to think of another word, it is likely, or it is more likely, that you will think of a word that is in some way related to table. This type of concept plays a very important role in military intelligence and analysis during the Second World War because nobody had perfect information. Because perfect information was not present, it was always possible that new information that was received would be filtered based on whether or not it fit within the existing threat scenarios. To give a specific example, and applicable to the situation in Norway, the Royal Navy spent the first few years of the war very concerned about the threat posed by German surface ships. The entire intelligence apparatus of the Royal Navy was primed with the concept of a surface ship breakout into the North Atlantic. And so any information about German naval preparations for actions immediately took them down the path of preparing to prevent a breakout attempt. This meant that when they received information about what the German Navy was doing, they would likely first think that they were about to break out into the North Atlantic. And it was only if other information was present that clearly pointed a different direction that they would start changing what they were expecting the Germans to do. There are a whole list of really important moments in the war where this idea of priming is important because it helps us explain why decisions were made and why certain evidence and activity was ignored by those involved. It can be hard to break away from preconceived ideas and concepts in situations where information is not perfect and even at times contradictory, which was often the case in military intelligence. So just keep that idea of priming in mind in, in this episode and also for a good portion of this podcast, because again, it is important at various points. Preparations for a large invasion are difficult, especially at one the size of the German invasion of Norway. They are basically impossible to hide. In early March, there were already reports of the German government setting up what they were calling travel agencies in Oslo, Bergen, and Stavanger. An interesting choice for sure, but not if the German government was attempting to pull together more information about those areas. This type of activity was concerning, but it would be in the last week of March that German actions and subsequently allied information about those actions began to accelerate. On March 26th, there were reports that there were a large number of ships concentrated at Kiel, and more were joining them. Also on the 26th, reports were made from Stockholm that the Germans were concentrating aircraft and shipping for a possible move into Scandinavia. The Norwegian ambassador in Germany would send a report that German troops were embarking on ships on April 1st. And then on April 4th and 6th, the RAF would be able to send multiple reconnaissance flights over those German ports, 
during which they found both a large fleet of merchant ships and then also a large grouping of German warships. Finally, on the eve of the invasion, the Danish intelligence services would observe various German ships moving north throughout April 8th, and these reports were passed on by the Danes to the Norwegians. With all of these activities happening and all the various reports being made to the various governments, why were the governments of Denmark, Norway, Britain, and France surprised with what was about to happen? Well, that's a complicated question. In Norway, it would start with some denial, because while there were many reports, there was no firm information that whatever the Germans were doing was actually going to target Norway. And without that firm evidence, there was a hesitancy to take any drastic actions. This hesitancy prevented the Norwegian military from being put on full alert due to concern that doing so would, according to Admiral Deason, commander of the 1st Military District, quote, just scare people. With a full military alert sort of out of the picture due to concerns about how it would impact public opinion and morale, the main actions that were taken by the Norwegian government in the days leading up to the invasion was simply a call for a few additional personnel to man some forts that protected Norwegian ports. Some of these orders did not even arrive in time to be useful. In defense of the lack of Norwegian action, they were also dealing with other problems, including the ongoing problem of the Allied threats to mine Norwegian waters. Some of these same excuses do not extend to London, Paris, and Copenhagen. In those nations, the inability to act on the information that they had was a bit more concerning, especially for the future of Denmark. In all three nations, the problems generally came down to a lack of organization on the intelligence side, and then a, a general inability to put the pieces together and then act on them. In Britain and France, the two nations that had the military ability to react to German actions, one of the problems is that during the early war years, their intelligence services were not really integrated. This meant that in Britain, say, MI5, MI6, and other groups within the government were not sharing information correctly and were certainly not coordinating their efforts effectively. These challenges would leave all four nations on the back foot when the invasion began. While the evidence was in the hands of the British and French governments by April 8th, there were already, at that point, limited options in terms of how to respond because the German plan was already in action and on its path to completion. This is because the first merchant ships of the operation to leave port had done so on April 3rd, with three ships on their way to Narvik. Over the next few days, five more ships would leave for Trondheim and Stavanger. Then on April 5th, the first information about the upcoming operation began to trickle down to the sailors of the German Navy when meetings were held by various officers with those under their command. One of these meetings would occur aboard the German destroyer Heidkamp, during which Commodore Friedrich Bonte would brief the captains and senior officers of the ten destroyers under his command. There had been rumors among the Kriegsmarine that something was about to happen, as the actions of the fleet were obvious, but this would be the first official information that these officers would receive that they were about to invade Norway just a few days before the attack would begin. Just after midnight on April 7th, the Scharnhorst and Gneisenau would leave port, joined by Bonte and his destroyers. They were then joined by the Hipper and two more destroyers. The reason that this specific grouping was important was because even though it would later break up and proceed in different directions to different destinations, it was for a brief period the strongest fleet that Germany had sorted into the North Sea since the First World War. This movement would be discovered by the RAF when a reconnaissance flight spotted them on their way north a few minutes before 9 a.m. on April 7th, although the exact count and type of the German ships was not known, and they would be somewhat misreported by both the reconnaissance flight and then later bombers. The crews of Bristol Blenheims of Squadron 107 were informed that they needed to be ready to launch a strike on the German ships later in the day, and then just before 11 a.m., they received the orders to launch along with the coordinates of the Scharnhorst and Gneisenau. Twelve Blenheims would find their way to the German ships, and they would attack the German vessels in three waves. In total, the 12 aircraft would drop a total of 45 125-kilogram bombs, but the amount of anti-aircraft fire made it challenging for the British aircraft to get low enough and just made it more difficult to drop their bombs accurately. As a result, all 45 of the armor-piercing bombs would only damage the water, because that's all they hit. And the German ships continued steaming north completely unharmed. I'm sure the water did not feel great, though. As would always occur when any German military ship was sighted, especially cruisers or battleships, the information made its way to the Admiralty over the course of April 7th. 
The first information would arrive early on April 7th, and then after the Blenheim bombers attacked, their after-action report would also arrive. At this point, the Admiralty did not really consider that the Germans might be making a move against Norway, primarily due to the fact that they did not believe that it was possible for the German Navy to protect an invasion from the actions of the Royal Navy. But what the German ships were doing only sort of mattered, because any time large German ships moved into the North Sea, the Royal Navy would answer, and they knew that there was at least one Scharnhorst-class battleship among the ships moving into the North Sea, and so they were ready to answer. Therefore, at about 5.30 in the evening, the ships of the home fleet, under the command of Admiral Forbes, were ordered to prepare to put to sea. And then a bit after 8 p.m., the ships would be put to sea. Two battleships, the Rodney and Valiant, the battlecruiser Repulse, two cruisers, Sheffield and Penelope, and ten destroyers. The challenge that all the ships in the North Sea would face was that late in the afternoon of April 7th, a new weather system moved into the area from the Atlantic, bringing with it low clouds and rain showers. This also heavily cut visibility and made flying very difficult. The rough seas made the troops on their way to Norway very seasick, but it was perhaps the perfect weather under which to conceal an invasion force. In fact, this weather system had been predicted by German meteorologists, aided by weather reports from the Atlantic, and it was generally welcomed by the leaders of the German Navy, even if some of the men on board probably less than thrilled about, you know, showing up for a couple days while they were at sea. Get cash for clothes at Plato's Closet in North Charleston and West Ashley. It's so easy. Recycle, earn cash, repeat. We pay cash on the spot for your trendy, gently used clothing, shoes, and accessories. At Plato's Closet, we buy all seasons, all day, every day. It's time to clean out your closet and cash in. Bring in your denim, graphic tees, athletic wear, shoes, handbags, and more. Sell your styles to Plato's Closet for cash. Then, do it again. Plato's Closet, located in West Ashley on Sam Rittenberg Boulevard and North Charleston on Rivers Avenue. While the home fleet was putting to sea, there were already British warships in the North Sea, and most importantly for the events that would follow, this included the battlecruiser Renown and a collection of British destroyers, including the HMS Glowworm. These ships had been sent to cover a mine-laying operation in Norwegian waters, and were on their way north to Narvik when the Glowworm was detached from the other ships to search for a man overboard. While the Glowworm was alone, it was sighted by two German destroyers, the Bernd von Arnhem, and the Hans Ludemann, which were accompanying the German heavy cruiser Admiral Hipper. The destroyers would then engage in a relatively brief gun duel. The weather at this time was about as far from ideal as possible, with rain, fog, and heavy seas, making it very challenging for the destroyers to engage in proper gunnery, and none of the ships involved at this stage of the fight actually hit anything. One thing that became apparent very quickly was that the British destroyer was far more seaworthy in the conditions that they were experiencing. The heavy seas caused damage to the German destroyers if they tried to run at too high of a speed, and in fact during this action the German destroyers would actually take on a good amount of damage just from the weather and sea conditions. The glowworm did not encounter the same problems due to design differences. Even though neither side was able to cause damage with its guns, the most important impact of this engagement was the information that it gave to other ships in the area, with the German destroyer sending a signal to the Admiral Hipper just before 9am. Back on the Hipper, a ship would be reported at about 9.50, although the exact identity of the ship was not determined at that time. The problem was still the weather, and there was some hesitation to open fire in case the destroyer was a German destroyer that might be out of expected position. The heavy seas made this a a very real possibility. However, just a few minutes later, when the ships were about 8,400 meters apart, the British White Ensign was clearly seen to be flying from the ship that had been observed by the Admiral Hipper, and so the Admiral Hipper's guns would open fire. In what can only really be considered a lucky shot given the weather situation, The British destroyer was hit on the fourth salvo from the hipper, with the shell hitting the starboard side of the British destroyer between the bridge and the funnel. The most important impact of this hit was that the radio room and the wireless antenna was destroyed, preventing any further information from being sent from the glowworm to other Royal Navy vessels. 
the glowworm's captain would order a torpedo salvo at the German ship, and then the glowworm was hit with some additional shells that hit its hull and started to cause flooding. This was the moment where things start to get fuzzy. Not so much as to what happened, we know exactly what happened, but why they happened. What we do know is that the glowworm would hit the hipper in the forward starboard side of the ship, as in it would ram the German ship. The glowworm's bow would break off after being pushed under the German cruiser, and the hipper would experience some damage, with about 150 feet of the cruiser's outer armor plating being pulled off the ship, and then the torpedo tubes in this area of the ship being destroyed. The glowworm would continue floating for a few minutes, But the ship had a large fire raging amidships, and really it was only a matter of time. And then at around 1024, the glowworm's boilers would explode, and the ship would rapidly sink. Those are all the solid facts. But the question that remains is whether or not the glowworm was actually trying to ram the hipper, or was it just an accident? There would be many British sailors rescued from the glowworm, but the captain and most of the officers were not among those who were rescued. The only surviving officer, Torpedo Officer Lieutenant Ramsey, would claim that the helm and the emergency rudder position were not manned at the time that the glowworm made its turn towards the hipper, meaning that it was not done on purpose but was instead simply an accident. British sources at the time claimed that the glowworm's captain instead made the decision to ram the German cruiser, an adversary that it had no hope of overcoming or outrunning, as kind of a last act of defiance. Such an action was, of course, a very good story, and the reasons that it was attractive to the British is is apparent. This story that the glowworm sort of rammed the German cruiser on purpose (laughs) became very popular in in histories after the war, and it is also something that is kind of questioned these days in a lot of sources, but this is an instance where I kind of leave it up to the listener to decide on, on what they wish to believe. Regardless of why the glowworm collided with the hipper, the result was the same, with the destroyer rapidly sinking. The captain of the hipper, Hay, would order that the hipper slow and begin rescue operations. It wasn't possible to lower boats due to the height of the seas, but ladders and ropes would be thrown over the side for any sailor who could climb aboard, or just hold on while the German sailors and even some of the German soldiers on their way to Norway started pulling people on board the ship. Unfortunately, of the 149 men aboard the Glowworm, only 38 would be rescued, with the Glowworm's commander, Lieutenant Commander Roop, not among them. While he was in the water, Roop would be seen helping other men to the ropes to be pulled aboard the German ship, but after helping so many, he would not have the strength to hold on to those same ropes himself and would fall as he was being pulled onto the ship, never to be seen again. For his efforts, Roop would receive the Victoria Cross after the war, when the glowworm survivors were finally brought back to Britain. While the death of so many men on the glowworm was tragic, and the loss of a destroyer was certainly never welcomed, the British destroyer did get contact reports off before its radio was destroyed. These reports would be sent first to the British battlecruiser Renown, with the information that the glowworm was engaging an enemy destroyer, along with a position report. Renown and the destroyer Greyhound would turn south after they received this report and begin moving towards the reported contacts from the north. At the same time, the sighting would also be reported to Admiral Forbes, who is at sea with the bulk of the home fleet. Now, the home fleet, anchored on some older battleships, was relatively slow due to the age of some of those battleships, and so Forbes made the decision to dispatch the battlecruiser Repulse two cruisers and four destroyers to move north at top speed to try and engage the German ships. Meanwhile, on board the Admiral Hipper, Admiral Lutgens was very concerned that the Glowworm's reports had given up the game for the Germans and that the British would know that some kind of operation against Norway was underway. What Lutgens did not know is that the actions of his ships and other reports of actions of the German Navy did have a serious impact on future events in Norway, just not in the way that he expected. This was because on April 8th, just before the start of the German invasion, the British were already quite far with their own plans to put troops ashore in Norway. Due to German actions, this was proceeding under the more defensive plan R4, under which groups of British soldiers would be landed at various areas in Norway to help defend against an impending German attack. However, a very important decision was made to cancel R4 on April 8th. 
This decision was made by Churchill and the Admiralty without a full discussion with the War Cabinet, with their justification being that due to German naval activities, the Royal Navy needed all of its strength to focus on the actions at sea. This was important because as part of Plan R4, the British would use cruisers and destroyers to move troops to Norway, needing their speed in the same way that the Germans were also using their military vessels to make the transit to Norway faster than merchant ships would allow. In fact, at the time that R4 was cancelled, the first cruiser squadron had already embarked the troops that it was to carry to Bergen and Stavanger later that very same day. But with the cancellation, these troops, which would be so badly needed in Norway just a day later, were taken off of the cruisers so that they could put to sea to pursue the German naval component of the invasion. This decision can, and should be, criticized, as it represented a moment where the leadership of the Royal Navy lost sight of the larger picture. Instead of focusing on the larger plan, preventing a successful German invasion of Norway, the Admiralty shifted all of its resources into the pursuit of an attack on the German Navy, which, if successful, would be good for the future war, but it would also be counteracted if the occupation of Norway should be successful. And they could not know this at the time, but some of the actions of R4 would have set up the Royal Navy to gain an even greater victory over the German naval forces that they were already trying to achieve. For example, if the first cruiser squadron had it just stuck to the plan, it would have been in perfect position to put its troops ashore hours before the Germans and then to attack the German ships as they were trying to get their own troops onto the shores of Norway. It was overall a, a real missed opportunity, which would only become truly apparent after the German invasion began. That German invasion will be the topic of next episode. <laughs>